All right, everyone, please welcome Ashley Boyer. Hello. I will start by explaining my question because it segues into a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm actually having foot surgery this Friday, and I didn't do anything, but that's why I'm sitting, if that's weird. I don't know what you guys do here. Yeah. I'm a front end person. I don't even know how to do movie stuff. But, <laughs> so I've never been here. Um, so that's why I asked that question because I will be in a boot and I probably won't want to stand that long. So that's why I asked about the chairs. That's yeah. good because that means your stuff is more accessible or watch fissures. Yes. They're accessible. You chose an accessible space. Very good. Um, what else was I going to say about that? Oh, I'll also have a uh, handicap parking tag temporarily since it'll be winter time. It's going to take forever to heal. Um, so, if you're wondering about a cool way to improve accessibility wherever you work, I work downtown. There's lots of opportunities for that. There's this app, it's called Parking Mobility, I think. And what I did today on my walk from the office to my car, it's like 10 minutes, is you can add handicap spots on there. And so that lets people know where those handicap spots are. And I actually added four. So there are way more than I thought there were. And that was only like a 10 minute walk. Um, so the other thing that people can do with that app is they can report like illegal parking. So if someone parks on the, uh, the lines, the cross lines, which you're not supposed to do, um, you can report that stuff there. So that's a really cool app. I figured I would mention since it was on my mind. But, do they make their money with towing fees, or how do they? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so it gets to the real part. Um, my name is Ashley Boyer. Thank you for coming. This is really nice and comfy. I like this space, even if it's dark. <laughs> um, I am a disabled developer. I was born with ears that don't work very well. Um, it's genetic. My mom has it. My grandma has it. So I can see this really nice progression of what my life will look like. And I will hear way worse later on. It's great. I'm excited. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you a little bit about my journey as a disabled developer. Um, and a little bit about accessibility in general. I just finished college about two months ago after six years. I'm almost six months into my second full-time job. I'm at Sixter. I do front-end web development with React. Uh, the system that I worked on previously used the vanilla everything, so I learned quite a bit about JavaScript. Um, and my then mentor, now friend, he taught me a lot about the really tiny, nitty gritty things that he had learned over the years because he had been developing for about five years at that place. Um, I sort of like to think of him as a human encyclopedia for CSS and JavaScript hacks. We always had a bunch of fun. Well, fun in quotes, because it's not always that fun hacking stuff together. Um, but thanks to him, I have a really helpful arsenal of debugging tactics that people don't really think about. I use them all the time. Um, also thanks to him, I had my first exposure to web accessibility because he uses a screen reader from time to time. And he just brought that up sometimes when we were making new features, so he would say, uh, something would or wouldn't work with the screen reader for whatever reason. So he got to share a lot of his experiences with me about good and mostly not good experiences with screen readers. Um, so he planted that seed for me way back then, and I didn't care about it as much. That was probably like a year ago, but that was just because I didn't know about it. And a lot of people just don't know about accessibility, so that's why I'm here. Before we continue though, I want to make sure everyone knows that this isn't to like guilt anyone for not knowing about accessibility or making excuses for not having accessibility in the past. This is purely just insight from me as a disabled person and to show you how easy it is to make web apps accessible. So let's start with thinking about who needs accessibility. There are four main categories of disabilities and each come with their own share of strategies for accessibility. The four categories are visual, auditory, motor, and cognitive. We'll take a shallow dive into each of these, and we won't only talk about the code side of things, but also content and product design. When it comes to visual disabilities from a design perspective, it's important to keep color contrast in mind and avoid placing text and images. Contrasting colors ensure people with low vision 
vision or color brightness can still consume content. And text and images can be hard for people to read if you don't have good contrast or like the background is super busy and you put maybe like thin text over the top of that. And screen readers are not magic, by the way. They can't just, they don't have AI. They can't like look at the image and do some uh, <coughs> magic over that and read what the text is. You have to actually assign stuff like alt text to images and then the screen reader will read that and present the image however you type it um, to the user. We should also be mindful about text sizes. So 16 pixels is a pretty good base size for body text, but we also want to make sure that all text on all of our pages scales for people that use larger font sizes, maybe with their phones. Um, so what you can do there is use dynamic units like RIM or M units, that's R-U-M and E-M, instead of pixel units, and then you know that your text is going to scale. I personally use RIM all the time, I don't fully understand M units. They're pretty scary. RIM does just one. <laughs> the last thing I want to mention for this category is the use of screen readers. I already talked about that. I'm reading from a script, so I didn't forget anything. I guess I jumped ahead. Um, but in and just how it works with HTML is you have your HTML document, and it reads just like you might read a book. You want to put things in the correct order that you want it to be presented as. Um, so for example, you have semantic HTML elements that are more descriptive. They're like landmarks. So you have a nav element and a main element and a section. And that makes it so that people can jump between sections. So that maybe you, know, you have blog posts listed on a page and maybe they just want to see the name of it. It makes it easy to jump to each one so they don't have to listen to everything to get halfway down the page. Um, the flow, which is what I was talking about briefly before, is really important because if you add a nav element to the end of your HTML, it'll get read last even if you position it at the top of a page using CSS. And then coming back to the alt text, you wanna make sure that that is descriptive. What I've learned after being not immersed in marketing, but Sixer does email signature marketing, is I guess some marketers like to put um, like SEO keywords in their alt text, and that that's just annoying. Like, don't do that. People put like ten or more because alt text is used for SEO. But a better experience would be describing an image with a sentence or two, um, maybe just how you would describe it to someone else. So to help with that, you could read it to whoever sits next to you at your work or something. Okay, the next category um, is auditory, and like mine, closed captions are absolutely amazing for me, especially when it comes to sites like YouTube where none of the content is created the same. Creators can have all the expensive equipment that they want, but that doesn't get them anywhere if they mumble or don't look at the camera when they're speaking or don't properly edit and test their content for good sound quality. So speaking of YouTube, if you're a content creator, I'm begging you not to use auto-generated captions because they are absolutely terrible, usually. They don't really have um, like grammar context, so no commas, no capitalization, and since we're so used to reading English, you know, like in a book, capitalization, those things work as landmarks to help you um, like it reduces the cognitive load on reading it, and if you use auto-generated, sometimes it uses the wrong words. Like if someone has an accent, they're usually geared towards English speakers, like really plain, no accent. So you're going to end up with incorrect words most of the time. So some of these same things relate to podcasts, which are typically audio only. I know of some podcasts that record a video too, so you can see people's faces. Usually those are really awkward, I think. <laughs> um, I would love to listen to all the podcasts that people recommend because there are so many of them. Um, and I would love to do that while driving or walking, but I've found that a lot of podcasts don't really have great sound. Like the volume will go in and out, or like it sounds like someone moved a microphone for like 30 seconds, and I don't know why they would do that. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. Or 
the volume is just really quiet. I've had one podcast that I listened to, I turned it all the way up in my car, and I still could not hear it. It was so terrible. So that's where good testing comes in. And this is also where transcripts can be helpful. Like, obviously don't read transcripts while driving, please. That's very dangerous. Um, but transcripts are really nice if you're sitting at home. And you can just pull up the transcripts while you listen on your phone or something. Um, excuse me. But I've also found that this is helpful, aside from that, like with cognitive things. Uh, I like listening to audiobooks and reading the book on paper. It helps me focus a lot better. So that's another benefit. I can talk about auditory disabilities all day long, but I'm not going to do that. So let's move on to the next category, which is motor. Accessibility in this category is about providing multiple means to navigate your site while also keeping each one as simple as possible. So think for a few seconds about how you navigate the internet. I'm sure that most people use a mouse. Um, you might use like the tab and the arrow keys to get through forms and stuff like that. Excuse me. Not really sure. I use tab a lot personally. Um, but some people don't really have options to choose what they want to do. So it's important to make sure that everyone can view and reach all of your content. And this also means being mindful about what kind of information is hidden behind collapsible content or tooltips. So finally, let's talk about cognitive accessibility. These strategies are also about simplifying things, and a lot of accessibility is about keeping things simple. But let's start with some examples. So think about Amazon and Craigslist. And the first thing that comes to mind when I think about those is like, wow, that is a ton of stuff just everywhere. It looks like somebody just vomited words all over the place. And they can be really hard to digest at first glance. They have text and links and buttons and complex layouts and buttons look like links and it's a whole bunch of mess. So consider reducing the amount of text on a page, the number of actions a user can perform, and the complexity of the text itself. Reducing these things helps make, make excuse me, reducing these helps make things straightforward for users. Some other things to think about are animations and auto-playing videos. Even small animations like fading the underline of a link in and out on hover can be distracting, overwhelming, or cause motion sickness. These things are pretty cool though too. So at a minimum, providing a way to reduce or eliminate these things is really helpful for people who don't want them. Maybe you know some people with disabilities that fall under one or more of these categories. I hope you've taken the time to imagine what it's like not only to navigate the internet with these disabilities, but also what it's like to navigate the world every single day. For me, it's scary walking around downtown every day because I never know if someone's running up on me from behind or missing a red light as I'm walking through a crosswalk, which people do that on purpose. I don't know why. It's very scary. Be careful. Don't, don't run through yellow lights, please. It's terrifying. <laughs> I also see a lot of terrible sidewalks around town with massive chunks of concrete missing, barriers blocking paths, or people pulling their cars at crosswalks at intersections. I think a lot of people don't notice that though, so that's just something to be mindful of in the future. I'm willing to bet that most of us spend a solid bit of time in the comfort of our home browsing the internet or watching a streaming service. It's an escape from the outside world and there's no shame in that. I watch so much private practice and Grey's Anatomy, so I binge stuff all the time. It is fantastic. But can you imagine what it's like to try to escape the everyday struggles of being disabled in an accessible world, only to come home and find most forms of entertainment also inaccessible, it makes it really difficult to escape. And I don't have this in the slides, but as an example, private practice is only on Hulu, so that's why I pay for Hulu. And I, I have a smart TV too, and there's a Hulu app on there, and it's terrible, I don't, I don't know why, um, but it, one, it's really choppy, so it flashes in and out of the different views, and then the closed captions, I don't know how to change the color, but they're yellow and it's hideous. It doesn't actually look like captions you would see on TV, so I'm not used to it. And the captions are also, they either disappear for like five seconds or more at a time, or they're just really behind. And 
that's not helpful at all. So what I did was I switched to my phone app and somehow it magically works better through a Chromecast. So that's awesome. But that might be something that you might not think about with accessibility is TV apps. So let's all go make those and make them better. <laughs> so the internet is necessary. Not everything is just about escaping. Like People do a lot of stuff on the internet every day. We pay for stuff there, like bills and groceries. We interact there with friends and family on social media, for example. We work there. I bet a bunch of us have the opportunity to work remote. We learn there. Everything I've learned about accessibility, I've learned from the internet, aside from my friends. And a lot of coders are self-taught or going through online boot camps. Everyone deserves access to the internet. The next thing might be tough to hear, if any of the rest of it made you uncomfortable. I'm glad, not to be mean, but discomfort <laughs> is good, it helps you grow. You're probably not hearing enough from disabled people about what they need. Most of the stakeholders we gather requirements from aren't fully informed. We can't just get designs and requirements from our CEOs or high-level executives and call it a day. For example, someone once told me, in defense of not having accessibility, I can't make an application for someone with no hands. That's not true at all. It was highly offensive because he should have known that I'm disabled and take that kind of stuff personally, even though I have two hands. Um, and it's a really irresponsible statement to make, especially since they were not actively engaged in the tech community or up to date on technical knowledge. Because it's very possible to make web applications that work for people who are missing limbs. Successful products require quality user research. There are plenty of books on this topic, but I think it comes down to a repeatable two-step process. Ask questions and then listen. Like really listen. So how do you really listen as opposed to regular listening? By using the knowledge you've been given. It takes a lot of energy to talk about your own disability. When you ask people about their experience and needs, please don't let their spent energy be wasted. So, I don't have a good segue into this because those previous slides are from another talk and I just wanted to reuse this. But I would like to talk a little bit about my workflow and how you can get started with accessibility. And I hope that these links work through the speaker side. I don't know. We'll see. So step one. Uh... <laughs> step one. Woo! <laughs> step one, get excited. That's fine. Uh, but really, step one is documentation. I think that's probably what we all do when we go to learn something new. You have to get a good idea of what you're about to come across. Um, and, good thing, accessibility is not a new concept. It's been out there for a while, and there are plenty of standards, and people have been researching this stuff for a long time, and they were kind enough to share that information. So, I'm going to try to click this link from over here. Web accessibility. And ignore the purple links. Obviously, I have visited them. I think this here. Okay, we're going to wing it. So, there it is. So, first thing you might do is go to Google and do a really simple search like web accessibility. And you can scroll through here. This is an ad. I never click on the ads. I don't like ads. More ads. Uh, I don't really go to Wikipedia either because I typically just dig for the sources in there, which are all the way at the bottom and I don't want to scroll through that. Wikipedia is also a really overwhelming site with really gross text that's not really readable in my opinion. But look at this, Introduction to Web Accessibility, the first nice site. So, Web Accessibility Initiative, W3C, I think web developers know who W3C are. So what I might go look at next is design and develop, since I'm a developer and I like design. And I'll scroll through here, looking for different stuff. We've got tips and resources, all kinds of things. And, oh look, offering practices. You might not go to this one first, but this is a really nice one I wanted to point to. So over here, we have design patterns and widgets. And I don't know why they use widgets instead of components. I think that's just the word that they came up with. 
But this is where I go when I want to make a new component and make sure that it's access accessible. So a good, easy one to go to might be a button. Button components are really nice. When you make a new component library, you probably make a button first. It's just the most used component, I think. And what they have here is they talk about what the widget does, when you might use it, and they talk about the different kinds of the widget. So toggle button and a menu button here. They have examples, and I'll click on this in a second, because I only have one hand. Um, and then they talk about keyboard interaction and the different ARIA rules, states, and properties. And these are really helpful because there are so many of them and I can't keep them straight. So the example, some of these also have several examples. And so in here they have ones that you can interact with and they display things in a little bit nicer format in the table so that you can easily refer to them later. And then they have code, the good part. So these are really helpful for me when I am looking to make new things. I'm gonna leave that up. We're about to click on another link. We're just gonna scroll through. Step two is get organized. So that was a ton of information. So what you need to do is simplify it down to exactly what you want to do. And you need to organize that information. I like making lists, like to-do lists. Um, it helps me know exactly what I need to do and not forget anything. So. <sighs> It's not gonna work. Open link. <laughs> I also like Trello a lot. And it's amazing that Trello is so great because it's Atlassian or whoever, and they also make Jira, which is less, much less great. But I really like this one. <laughs> so I am making a component library, I guess. I have this repository where I'm working on practicing these things and learning more about accessibility and all the different ARIA things. So this is how I am organizing myself right now. Um, I'll pretty much make a card for something new. Uh, like I have a list box component, which isn't clear what it is. It's actually like a drop down. I wanna know who came up with these names because they're kind of nice and I'm not very good at naming things. So this is how I like to organize things. And it's pretty much like a, a typical board, I think, that people make like on Jira, for example. Um, the really nice thing that I discovered this week is that Trello has a GitHub power-up, and you can attach branches and commits and issues and pull requests. I love linking things and organizing things. So it makes it really easy to see exactly how I solved some problem or did some research or something. And the other part, I have to remember what this next one is. Okay, so more on the organization part. I have an issue in here and I cannot remember where it is. Okay, so I think issues are really nice where I can put to do check boxes in there. Um, I'm the only person in this repository, so it might look weird because I'm basically talking to myself, but I'm enjoying it, it's a great time. <laughs> so, it's fine. Yeah, can you make it bigger, please? What is that? What is that? Can you make the text bigger? Make this bigger? Zoom in? Yeah. Yes. Like Command Plus, I think. Thank you. That big enough? Okay. Alright, so. I'm pretty sure this just links to the repository. So we're gonna leave that open. But the next step is to start coding after you know exactly what you wanna code. And coding is just about practice. That's really it. Um, accessibility is just like learning any new concept or adding anything, any kind of new tool to your daily workflow. You just have to get used to it. That's really all it is. So we'll go back over here. This is my repository. If you didn't know, this is usually pronounced A11Y, and it is a shortened version, kind of like internationalization is I18N, and it's because there are 11 letters between the A and the Y in accessibility. You can say ally, 
if you want. I don't know. I say that in my head when I read it, but I think it's A11Y, technically. So all I'm doing here is keeping things documented so that I don't forget them and if people want to read it, which I guess people do because I have some stars in here from when I shared it on Twitter, so that feels really cool for it being a very tiny and brand new thing. I am just organizing things, kind of like Shopify. I don't know if you've looked at their Polaris React repository, but it is absolutely beautiful. And I recommend you check it out if you ever wonder how to structure things. They do a really good job of it. So I have my components in here, and I worked on a button. Like, all this stuff is super brand new. This one. Like this is, this is not a finished button. And on that, you should share things before you're ready to share them. That's a thing by this thing, I think. <laughs> but this is what I plan on doing, making various components and a list box as a drop down. Um, I try to link my documentation where I need to so that it's easy to get to. And that is, what that workflow looks like. I make pull requests too, which feels really weird since nobody's reviewing them and I'm not reviewing them. I'm just like, hey, here's an idea. And they're like, oh, great idea, Ashley. Let's add that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is how I am doing this. I'm trying to remember which pull request has me talking to myself more. But when you link something in Trello, it makes a comment which is not like a super useful comment. It's just the name of the card, I think. I haven't seen anything different than that. But then I quote comments in on it. I was like, oh, Charles, cool. Even though I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is my workflow. Let's try this one. I don't have speaker notes, but it's fine. Okay, so step four, like I was saying, learn out loud. Share stuff before you're ready to share it. Because you're gonna help other people learn too. I think it, this, this is not a very humble thing to say, but I think it makes you look a little bit more humble to other people because I don't wanna come across as someone who's like nagging at you to do accessibility. Like you should definitely do accessibility. Um, but I'm not an expert. I'm, that's what I wanna be eventually, but I haven't learned everything and you have to start somewhere. So when you share those things, you're helping other people that haven't started yet either. And that's a good thing to do. The internet is good for this. I think this actually needs to the GitHub. It does. <laughs> All right, that's it. So, too long, didn't read. Hopefully you were listening. But if you weren't, here are the main points that we covered. Accessibility is a need. It isn't something that you just push aside. Um, it's really hard to argue for accessibility. So before anyone asks me that question, I do not know the answer. Because even as a disabled person, people have still not listened fully to that. Um, you just have to try different tactics. And hopefully it doesn't come down to it. Like you can come from an empathy perspective of like, hey, it really sucks when you can't use the internet. You know, you should avoid that at all costs if you can. And you can with accessibility. Um, after that, you might talk about money, like you'll have a bigger audience um, when you have something that's accessible to more people, which isn't the most fun thing to discuss, but it is a discussion point. And then the other thing is um, legal reasons. I don't know if anyone knows, I mean, we have Domino's here, but Domino's was sued by a blind man because he couldn't order pizza from their app. And that has gone on for three years now. So it's like, Domino's is really fighting against this, which in all the money that they've spent with the legal things, they probably could have made their application accessible. And they even, like in January, I think it was, they brought forth a um, appeal to the Supreme Court, I think. And then the, the Supreme Court said no, because people want their pizza, just give them their pizza. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at all of my jokes. I really appreciate it. It's my <laughs> best skill, actually, is laughing, so. That's a good skill to have. <laughs> Maybe my only skill, I'm not sure. High fives. <laughs> oh, high fives, there you go. Laughing and high fives, that's what Miles does. 
So the next point is research, ask, listen, and repeat. It's just, that's pretty much what we do with everything else. You can do it with another topic like accessibility. Spread the knowledge. That is a really good one. Um, you learn a lot by teaching other people. So if you have friends that are wondering about accessibility or people who are wondering about it at work, just have a discussion about it. It's fun to talk about. And um, on that website where all the documentation is, I found the other day with a list box, which is a drop down. Um, you can turn things into challenging code problems, which, I mean, we like it when we're beginners. I'm still sort of a beginner. I've only been in the industry for a couple of years, so maybe I'm still interested in fun challenges. And I talk to a lot of code newbies, so I like a lot of challenges. But one of them is when you're focused on this drop down and you hit a key, like the letter T, what you're supposed to do is focus the first thing in that list that starts with a T. And I don't know how to implement that, but it sounds really fun to implement. Would you search it? Would you loop over all the things? Probably not, but I don't know. And there's just a lot of code challenges like that that you'll come across that can make it fun if you're in the right mentality. So, thank you. I have resources attached to the speaker notes in this slide. Um, a lot of good places to start reading and you can also come talk to me. I want to talk about accessibility all the time, so that's it. Any questions? I'm going to stop you real quick because they're very far back there. Um, would you like to come up and speak in the microphone? <laughs> I'll need it back, so this just makes it easier. Thank you. It's more concisely. Um, is there like a, a single facet of this thing that is, is a good like first push on implementing accessibility site-wide that's sort of like low impact but high reward that you can say like let's start here show the benefit like take it to the higher ups who may have been resistant in the past that's like where would you start on something like this or is there something that fits that yeah i'm trying to think about that because i wanted to do more accessibility stuff at my first job not my second one um and part of what attracted me to the second one is that there were already some considerations for accessibility. And I think the easiest place to start obviously depends on how your organization is set up. Like at my, at my first place, we didn't have any designer specific CEO handed out designs and it was a great time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think probably the first place to start would be with colors um, because you're not really adding any new code there you might be replacing some existing code like in your CSS and if you do have a design team they're really the people that make the UX the experience design too with how many buttons you're gonna have on a page or something like that um, so that probably is the place to start um, if you don't have something like that, I guess if you are like me and you use React and third-party libraries a lot, making sure that if you use new libraries that they're accessible, so searching for accessible components first, um, you may not necessarily have the time to build them, which is a sad thing, but I understand that it's true. And on that, it's okay if you don't do everything perfectly. Like, I don't think people are going to be mad at you. Showing that effort is what really matters, though. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hi. Hi. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I went to Reactathon in the spring, and one of the talks was actually on accessibility. And the recommendation of that speaker was to start with um, linting rules 
So for example, in React, there's JSX hyphen A11Y, um, and extending off the Airbnb ones as a start, and then like turning those on one by one in your app until they're all fixed. Um, and then another thing that they recommended was using Axe, the browser extension. Um, one thing that I did find at one of the jobs I worked at is that um, I'm not sure if this was intended to be their long-term effort, but that's kind of how I viewed it, was um, they were using Axe as a replacement for an actual accessibility effort. So I don't know if you have ever run into someone in a leadership role or at another company who's kind of viewed like, well, we've covered the basics. We ran Axe and now all of our elements have IDs or we are using um, headers that are in the correct order and now we don't have to do anything else. So. I don't know, um, that's the impression I got. And I don't know if you run into that as well, people thinking like doing the smallest amount is enough. Yeah, I can talk. Um, the same person that told me you can't make apps for people with no hands told me that it's magic to make text grow with devices and things. So I guess he had never heard of dynamic units. Um, but yeah, I've run into that people saying that it's fine to meet the minimum. and. I would encourage you not to spend too much energy on convincing people that accessibility is a need uh, because that gets into like empathy and compassion and if you're dealing with high level executives which are usually a little older like not not to say 30 or 40 is old but at that <laughs> point <laughs> I'm sorry 30 and 40 year olds oh. and older that's not what I was trying to say. It didn't come out right. Um, but at that point, you're pretty much set in your ways. And I don't know if you can teach people how to be compassionate. Like, that's what parents should do. So I don't really know what to do at that age. Don't parent people. It's, it's really hard. And it's probably not worth your effort, honestly. Which is one of the reasons why I left my first job, is because I was so frustrated that I couldn't convince them that accessibility was important. Um, so yeah, and to add to those, that nice list that she listed, um, in Chrome, built in, there is a thing called Lighthouse, and you can do tests on there, and it will give you an accessibility score, and it'll tell you things like, you have an image on this page that's missing an alt text, so it gives you a nice little to-do list, but it's really, it's not a deep dive. I saw someone write a blog post about they got a 100% accessibility score, from Lighthouse, and it was actually super inaccessible. I don't know how they did it. I didn't end up reading it. It's in my bookmark somewhere. <laughs> but those tools can be really helpful. Um, manual testing is the best, though, if you have time for it. Any more questions? I love this. Thank you so much for explaining your energy. So I was sitting there thinking about, I haven't made a site accessible. Will straight mess up. But I was in there thinking about how I would do it. And so people talked about the techniques of like um, taking their current markup and adding things to it to make it more accessible. What about what about just having an entirely separate site that is you got your GWiz, all the eye candy site, and then you've got another very stripped down site that's particularly for accessibility. Is that uh, frowned upon in the community? Do they want just one site with all the same URLs perhaps? Or would it be acceptable to have something that's um, very pared down and very um, access specific? Okay, <clears throat> so there are a couple of things there. Um, one, one of the first things that comes to mind is how would you implement that? Are you going to have separate web links for people to know? I'd probably have a top level uh, subdomain or I'd have a top level directory that you hit that and that would be your accessible point. And then after that, all the URLs would be the same parallel what's in the, for lack of a better word, main site. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be extra things to remember for whoever has the subdomains. Correct. Um, and the other thing that comes to that is it's kind of segregating in a way, not to separate people so that they don't interact with each other or anything like that. So I'm not using the harsher term of that word. Um, but making extra things is gonna be 
hardware because you've made two versions of things probably. Um, so you could silo that work into one thing and it would probably, it would be less work than making two, but it's more work than making one. Um, so, yeah, segregating those things, I really wouldn't recommend making a separate site that is different than the first one. I would recommend simplifying, like maybe paring down some of the things, because you can still do cool stuff with accessibility. It just takes a little bit of extra work, like making custom components based on the ones that I have shown up. Um, there are people that have made accessible components. I haven't tested all of them, because that's a lot of work. And I just hope for the best that other people have done a good job of testing their own things. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't recommend making separate things um, that probably would be well received by people in the disabled community because it would be just another thing of being separate and having something different. It's kind of, maybe othering is a better word for it. And there's already so much othering with so many different things that it wouldn't be very helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone else?